It's such a pleasure to be here. I mean, legitimately, it's so beautiful up here. You are so lucky to live up here. Um, I have had the pleasure to come to Idaho many times. I've never been to Coeur d'Alene, though, before. And um, when I was asked, I thought, oh, I think, like, I have heard so much about Coeur d'Alene. Um, I have a lot of friends from Idaho, and they always talk about how beautiful it is. And we have some really good friends who come and spend the whole summer up here every year. And so, uh, and then it was suggested that it might be possible to come for a couple extra days. And I was like, yes, absolutely, yes. And um, <laughs> so we decided to come up. And it is so beautiful. And my husband, he could only come up for about a day. And so he came up. And initially, he was like, oh, well, if it's just a day, is it really worth me coming up? And I was like, yes, it's really worth you coming up. Just come. And by the end of the day, I caught him looking at real estate. <laughs> and um, the funny thing about it is, is that a number of years ago, I spoke at a conference in Boise. And there were two things that I really remember about that conference. The first thing is that there is no classy or elegant way to blow your nose on stage in front of a microphone in front of a live audience. It just, there's just no graceful way to do that. The second thing, and probably more interesting thing that I learned, is that Idaho has more millionaires per capita than any other state. At least that was a couple years ago when I spoke. I think I found them all. I mean, by property values up here, you definitely have to be millionaires. Anyway, it's, it's so beautiful up here, and I'm so thrilled to be up here and to be able to spend this lunch time with you. Um, I have had many opportunities that I'm so grateful for to have traveled around the United States and to spoken at uh, different conferences and different events and listened to survivors. And I think the one thing that I'm always so truly inspired by is the resiliency that I have seen within humanity and how many people, good people, there are in this world who who are there to support, who are there to help. I mean, whatever cause it is, who are willing to sacrifice their time to help each other out. And that is probably one of the most inspiring things that, that I see on a pretty frequent level. Although, if you turn on the news, you'd think that all humanity is gone. But it's not. And I feel so lucky that I get to see that. And I'm continually humbled because I have people approach me all the time saying, you haven't changed a day from when you were 14, and I prayed for you. Or I remember exactly where I was the day that you were rescued. I'll never forget it. I was grocery shopping at the store, or I was picking my kids up from school, or my neighbor came running out of her house screaming at the top of her lungs, and I thought she was dying, or someone in her house was dying, but it was really because you were found on the news. Um, I have those comments directed at me all the time, and I will feel a debt of gratitude for the rest of my life because I don't believe that I would be here had I not had so many hundreds of thousands of people searching for me and praying for me and making sacrifices for me. And I will never take that for granted. And I'm, I'm so thankful to, to all of you and to everyone who, who helped in bringing me home because before I was kidnapped, I didn't feel like I was really that different from anyone else. I felt like I blended in pretty well. And quite frankly, I was happy just blending in. I was completely fine blending in. I never felt um, ambition to be in the spotlight or to be noticed. Or I, I was just happy. I was comfortable just being a wallflower, I was perfectly fine with that. And I remember it was the end of my junior high, and I was excited to leave junior high in the past. I was excited to go on to high school. Um, I was excited for the summer. I just, I remember really only feeling good things in my life, that good things were ahead of me. Um, I didn't have any feelings of something bad was going to happen. I remember even just days before I was kidnapped thinking, 
how bad of a thing could really happen to me? I mean, I live in a safe community. I live in a nice home. I have a good family. I mean, if I had to take a bet on how my life is going to go, you know, I'm going to go to high school, I'll go to college, I'll eventually get married, I'll have kids, and then the cycle will start all over. And so, really, nothing that crazy can happen to me. That was just, just days before I was kidnapped. And then the night that I was kidnapped, I'll never forget waking up to the words, I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound, get up and come with me. And the first time I heard that, I thought, this can't, this can't be real. I mean, I'm in my bed. I'm in my home. I'm asleep next to my younger sister. There's no way that someone could break into my home in the middle of the night, get all the way upstairs to my bedroom, and put a knife on my neck and tell me to go with them. This, this just can't be real. So I didn't immediately respond, and I just laid there. And then I heard the voice again repeating the same words again, saying, I have a knife at your neck, don't make a sound, get up and come with me. And the second time that I heard that, I remember opening my eyes and sure enough, there was this dark figure standing above me, holding a knife on my neck, telling me to get up and go with him. Well, I was terrified and I didn't feel like I had a choice. So I got up and I went with him and I did exactly as he told me. He led me out through my backyard and up into the mountains behind my home. To me, I don't know, it felt like we went really far, but at the same time, it, it didn't feel like we were, we were that far from my home. I don't know, it's almost hard to explain. But I remember we crossed right over the top of one of the mountains behind my home, and we started down the other side, and we came to this stand of trees, which is not that strange, and it looked very similar to all the other brush, all the other trees we'd fought our way through going up. But once I got into the middle of this stand of trees, I remember seeing there was a tent set up, there were tarps lying on the ground, there were some tarps hanging up in the trees. I remember seeing this big hole that had been dug out behind the tent, I had no idea what that was for. I remember seeing this piece of metal cable that ran um, from one tree right next to the tent just a couple yards further to another tree. And I mean, it was on, it was on an incline, so I thought, well, oh, I, I have no idea what that's for, but okay, maybe it's to hold on for a few feet to walk across the camp, I, I don't know. And then I remember this woman appearing and she absolutely was dressed differently than really anyone I'd ever seen before uh, but what really set her apart or what made her so different wasn't so much the way that she looked but it was the way that I felt when I saw her as soon as I saw her I just knew that she wasn't there to help me I just knew that I could not count on her to protect me whatsoever, which the whole way up, the whole way, the whole time he'd kidnapped me and taken me up into the mountains, I kept trying to jump from conclusion to conclusion as to why he would kidnap me. Why would he want me? Why would he choose me? And I think my brain to some level was trying to protect me and make me feel like there had to be a reasonable explanation as to why this was happening. You know, maybe they lost a daughter, maybe she had died, maybe they couldn't have kids, something like that. Some very, not that there's an innocent excuse for kidnapping a child, but if there was, something along those lines. And when I saw her, I knew that's not why. I didn't know why they'd kidnapped me, I still didn't know why but I knew that that was not it. I remember she led me inside the tent where she had sat me down on this upturned bucket and I remember looking around the tent to see what was inside and there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot in there. I mean, there was just some blankets on the ground and some pillows and that was about it. And she brought in this small little plastic blue basin and she set it down and she started to take off my shoes and she started cleaning the dirt off of my feet. And then she started to try to undress me and I was, I was very shy as, as a kid. I was very self-conscious. I mean, I'm a late bloomer in, in lots of things, and puberty was just one of them. I mean, I remember being in choir in eighth grade, and our choir uniform was honestly the most innocent v-neck white t-shirt and long black skirt that you can possibly imagine. But I remember putting on that white v-neck t-shirt for choir and being like, oh my goodness, 
I am showing so much decolletage. What is everyone going to think of me? I was not showing anything. I mean, first of all, I had nothing to show. And second of all, it was nothing. Like, it was not a deep V-neck by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. But that was me, and that was what I was like. I mean, it was to the point where the pajamas that I had been kidnapped in, they were bright red sort of silky material. And it was like a full-blown pajama set, like the pants and the button-up shirt. I had taken the top of the collar, and I had safety pinned it over. So it really was like right at the base of my neck, like shut. And that was, that was just me. So as this woman started to try to undress me, she started to try to take the safety pin off. She started to try to take the buttons off my pajamas. I remember just grabbing hold of them and just begging her, no, she couldn't do this. How could she think this was okay? How could she, how could she do this to me? And I, I did not know at the time what a determined woman she was. Uh, once she made up her mind about something, that was it. There was really no alternative for her. I mean, there was only her way forward. And at that point in time, I mean, as I mentioned, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, and she had made up her mind that she was going to undress me and she was going to sponge bathe me and then she was going to give me uh, a robe, sort of like a tunic kind of robe that you pull on over your head, um, just like the one she had on and she was going to dress me in that. And I remember just begging and pleading with her, how could she do this? I mean, I was, I was 14, I was a big girl. If she really wanted me to change, I could change myself. I wasn't dirty. I showered last night before I went to bed. I mean, why, why was she doing this? And she finally gave in, which, as I mentioned, I did not realize what a big deal that was. That was, a, that was a huge deal. She never gave in on anything, especially when it came to me. If anything, she was harder on me. So she passed me this long sort of robe, and she told me to put it on, and I did. And then she had me take off all my clothes underneath, and I did. And then she scooped them up, and she got up and walked out of the tent. And I remember just sitting on this upturned bucket being so scared and so confused. How had this happened to me? Why was this happening to me? I mean, I had just gone from less than 24 hours earlier from you know, being at school, talking with my friends about our summer plans and our you know, junior high graduation plans to all of a sudden being kidnapped up on a mountainside with these two strangers, people I didn't know. I just was having such a hard time understanding how and why this had happened to me. I remember in the meantime, in came the man who had kidnapped me, and he had changed out of the dark clothes that he initially wore to kidnap me in. And he had a long tunic on, just long robe, just like the one that the woman had on, just like the one that I'd been forced to put on. And he came in and he knelt down next to me. And that was when the, he told me that I was now his wife. And of everything that I expected to hear, I mean, that, that definitely was not one of them. I mean, I was shocked. I remember just screaming out no. And he looked at me and he said, if you ever, if you ever scream out like that again, I, I will kill you. If it'll help you to not scream out, you know, I can duct tape your mouth shut. Well, I, I knew that I didn't want to be killed. I knew that I didn't want my mouth duct taped shut, but he had to understand why this was not okay. And I remember going through reason after reason as to why this wasn't okay. I mean, I was 14. You know, I, I was just a little girl. I, I wasn't old enough. I didn't know him. He was an old man. Gross. Um, <laughs> going through all these reasons, and every reason that I gave him, he kept having the same response, which was, it's now time to consummate our marriage. Well, I lived a pretty sheltered life. I didn't know what that was exactly. I mean, I remember sitting there thinking what he could possibly mean. I'd only learned what sex was recently, and the thought of sex, I mean, already was abhorrent to me. It was disgusting to me. I mean, like I mentioned, I was a very, very sheltered kid growing up, and those body parts, all I knew about him was that it's where pee comes out of. And that was the only use for them. So the thought that something else, you'd use it for something else, was just like, 
really, really outside of like my realm of understanding. And I finally realized what he meant when he said it's now time to consummate our marriage. And I remember just begging him and pleading him to leave me alone. I mean, how could this, how could this be okay? How could he do that to me? Someone he didn't know to a child because that's what I was. I mean, I was a kid. How could he do that? But it, it didn't matter. Ultimately, he forced me on the ground, pulled up the robe I'd just been forced to put on, and he raped me. And when he was finished, he kind of stood up and he smiled and turned around and walked out of the tent like it wasn't a big deal. But to me, to me, that was a huge deal. I mean, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. I mean, I grew up in like the most Mormon of households, I'll just say it. <laughs> like, I grew up going to church every single Sunday and I feel like, especially in that 13, 14, 13 to 18 year old range, there was a lesson on chastity and virtue and abstinence until marriage, like every other Sunday. And up until that point in my life, like I'd just sit and roll my eyes and be like, are you for real? Again? Like we're talking about this again? This is not even a temptation. Why are we talking about this again? And in all of these lessons, I mean, as well-meaning and good-hearted as all my teachers had been, no one had ever taken the time to describe to me the difference between enthusiastic consensual sex versus rape and sexual violence. Nobody taught me a difference. So in my mind, it was the same thing. And I had just sat there listening to teachers telling me that you know you you'd be dirty and you wouldn't people wouldn't want you boys wouldn't want to marry you you wouldn't you know you you wouldn't be as good as everyone else I mean maybe they didn't quite use those exact words but it was always to that same general effect that same general message that if you wanted to get married then you needed to be a virgin until your wedding night and uh, otherwise you were dirty. Otherwise, you weren't as good as everyone else. And so having just been raped on this mountainside, I felt dirty. I felt ruined. I mean, not only physically was I in a lot of pain, um, but emotionally and spiritually, I felt pretty destroyed. And I remember just lying on the ground, just crying over what I felt like I had lost. Not only had I lost my family, had I lost my home, my friends, basically my life in every way that counted, but now I also lost my value as a human being. And I genuinely felt that way. And I don't remember at that point if I fell asleep or if I just passed out. But the next thing I remember seeing was this man kneeling above me, and this time he had a piece of metal cable, and he was wrapping it around my ankle, and then he was crushing bolts into place so that I couldn't run away. I remember standing up to see what this, this metal cable was connected to, and I saw it was wrapped around that original piece of metal cable I saw running through the camp when I first was brought to this mountainside hideout. And it allowed me to move about 10, 12 feet, maybe just far enough to lie down inside the tent and just far enough for me to use the bucket. And that was as far as I could move. I remember my, both my captors coming in at that point and telling me that my name was no longer Elizabeth and that I would now go by the name Sher Jashub. And I remember just thinking, what? Where did you get that name from? Why do you think that's okay to call me that? That is not my name. And they went on to tell me how lucky I was that I had been chosen by them. And not just chosen by them, but chosen by God to be kidnapped, to become his second wife. And not only would I be his second wife, but I would also be servant to his first wife, Wanda Barzi, which I, I didn't know her name at that time um, as Wanda Barzish. They told me it was, it was Hepzibah. 
And I just remember thinking, what kind of world am I in now? They're telling me that God commanded them to do this to me. They're telling me that Elizabeth is not my name. They're trying to give me this other crazy name. I'm like They have crazy names. Who are these people? Where, where did they come from? What is wrong with them? And I remember thinking at that point in time that really my life could not get worse. I remember feeling like this really had to be as bad as it could possibly get. How wrong I was. <laughs> One lesson that I definitely learned from my kidnapping is never say this is the worst. It, things can not possibly get any worse because as soon as you tempt fate, things will get worse. The very next day, right after thinking things couldn't get any worse, both my captors had noticed how how shy and self-conscious I was. So to exploit that further, they decided that they would force me to go all day naked. And they did. And I remember being mortified. I remember feeling so terrible about myself. Why did they think this was OK? I couldn't understand it. And I mean, that's how the whole nine months went while I was gone. I mean, every time I thought things couldn't get worse, somehow they'd find a way to make things get worse. But that first day that I was kidnapped, when I was sitting up on that mountainside, I remember looking around this hidden campsite, wondering how long were they going to keep me for? Was it days or weeks or months? Like, was it, how long was it going to be for? And the thought struck me that it might be so long that I forget who I truly am. I mean, what if it's years and years and years? That thought really scared me that I might forget my life. I might forget who I was before I'd been kidnapped. I might forget my parents or my brothers or my sister. What, what would I do then? How, how could I ever forget them? And that, the thought that I might, that might actually happen terrified me. And so I made up my mind that I would, I would never forget my family. Because even if I was never loved ever again, that would be OK. Because I knew what it felt like to be loved. Because I'd been loved for the first 14 years of my life. And I mean, my, my family definitely is not perfect, was not perfect then, definitely is not perfect now. Uh, but I knew that they loved me. And I knew what that felt like. So. I knew I never wanted to forget them. And as I was sitting there trying to just memorize everything I could to make sure that I never forgot them, I had a memory come to mind that it involved my mom. And I'd come home from school one day where one of the really popular girls had, she'd been bullying me. She wasn't very nice to me. And I'd sat down and I was pretty upset. And I told my mom what had happened. And she sat down next to me. And, you know, she tried to comfort me, tried to make me feel better. She's like, you know, Elizabeth, this girl, you say she's popular? Don't you know that popular is just another word for rude anyway? <laughs> that didn't make me feel any better. She went on, she's like, and you said you weren't even by yourself. You said you were sitting next to some of your friends. What, and none of your friends stood up for you? You know, we have a term for that. They're called fair weather friends. That didn't make me feel any better either. I was thinking, oh, so you're telling me I aspire to be friends with someone's rude, and the friends that I do have, they're not very good friends anyway. And then she went on and she said, you know, you'll meet so many people in your lifetime, and opinions will be made about you, whether you like it or not. You can have the purest of, tension, of intentions. You can have, you know, the kindest of hearts. You can try your very best. But there'll always be someone who doesn't agree with you. There'll always be someone who, who doesn't like you. There'll always be someone, just for whatever reason, who you know doesn't really care to have anything to do with you. And you need to learn to be OK with that. Because if you can't be OK you know, with knowing that there are people who disagree with you or don't like you in this world, 
but then you're going to be miserable the rest of your life because you'll never, you'll never please everyone. You'll never have everyone always like you. So you need to depend, you need to decide whose opinions actually matter. You know, does this girl, does this popular girl, does her opinion really matter? Are you going to let her decide your happiness or not? You know, what about these other friends that you're sitting with? Are you going to let them decide whether you're happy or not? Or is that going to be your decision? Are you going to make that decision for yourself? And at that point in time, honestly, I used to hate it when my mom would tell me these things. I mean, she'd always, she'd be the first one to say, what do you do when a horse bucks you off? You get back on. You know, what do you do when you fall down? You get back up. I mean... That was always her attitude. You didn't stop, you didn't give up, you didn't just sit and feel sorry for yourself. You always got back up, you always got back on the horse, you always kept trying. And at that point in time, I didn't really appreciate that kind of attitude coming from her. I just wanted her to let me feel sorry for myself for a little bit and commiserate with me. Let me indulge in my pity party for myself. She went on and she said, you know, of all these opinions that are made, really, there's only a few that actually matter. You know, and I can help you out with the first few opinions that matter. The first opinion, who you should probably worry about, is God's. He loves you. He always will. Might not love, you know, your decisions, but will always love you. The second person, whose opinion, that you should probably worry about, well, that would be mine. And I'm your mom. And I will always love you. I may not love your decisions. I may not agree with everything you decide to do or like the people you decide to be around, but I will always love you. And that will never, ever change. You'll always be my daughter. I will always love you. And as I sat on this mountainside, remembering this memory, I realized I had something worth surviving for. I realized that I had something that my captors could not take away from me. They might be able to take away everything else. I mean, they could take away I mean, my life. They could kill me if they wanted to. But they couldn't take away the fact that my parents would always love me. And that would never change. And it didn't matter that I had been kidnapped. It didn't matter that I had been raped. It didn't matter that I had been chained up. My parents would still want me back and they'd still love me. And maybe, maybe nobody else ever would want anything to do with me. Maybe nobody else, maybe I would be dirty for the rest of my life. You know, maybe I would never find my Prince Charming. Maybe I wouldn't have the traditional sense of happily ever after. That would be okay because I would still have my family and they would still love me. So it was in that moment that I was able to make the most important decision I could have during my entire nine months of captivity. I decided I would do whatever it took. It didn't matter what it was. I would do whatever it took to survive. And that's how I survived the next nine months. And that decision was questioned, I feel like, every single day. Because there were so many times when I felt like, I really can't do this another day. I really don't think. I can survive this any longer. I really don't think that I can even imagine the situation to be any worse. <laughs> but somehow, I'd make it through that second and that moment and that day. And I made it through nine months. And they were the longest nine months of my life, without a question. I remember so many times during those nine months that I felt like I was so close to being rescued. In the first few weeks even that I was held captive, I actually remember someone yelling out my name. And I remember just thinking, you, you are almost here. I mean, it was far away and it was faint. But I remember thinking, just keep going. I am so close. You are so close. My captors heard someone yelling out my name as well. And they had immediately both grabbed hold of me. Not that I could have run, because I was chained up, but they grabbed hold of me and he pulled out his knife and he said, if you scream, you know what the consequences are. If anyone comes into this camp, you'll re be responsible for the death of whoever enters into this campsite. And I remember being terrified and at the same time still so hopeful that somehow someone would save me. I used to daydream about 
about the kind of scenes we see in like the Avenger movies or superhero movies or, or even like James Bond movies when you see those really big army helicopters that have like all of that heavy like armor around them and the ropes you just see the ropes dropping out of the side of the helicopters and then guys in full body combat gear you know repelling down the ropes I used to dream about that happening, especially when helicopters would fly so low overhead, the trees and the tent that we were in would shake. And I just sit there and imagine them rappelling down and rescuing me and saving me from these two monsters. And eventually the helicopters, they stopped flying over and the yelling and the shouting of my name eventually faded and we didn't hear it anymore. And I remember questioning, would I ever be found? Would I ever make it back to my family? At one point, my captors deemed that enough commotion had died down that it would be safe enough to take me out into public. Um, I would be covered head to toe. I would always be right in between my two captors. Um, they would always be touching me at all, all times. They would never never leave me unsupervised. I, I would always be with them. And it would just be for a short period of time. And I remember they eventually started taking me out into public. And it, it wasn't very often, um, but they did. And by that time period, I mean, months had passed. Months in which I had been so severely abused and disheartened that it it made it feel like my two captors were invincible because everything that they had threatened me with up until that point, they had followed through with. So who could stop them from hurting me now? Who could stop them from hurting my family? Um, he used to bring back missing newspaper articles or missing posters, and he would talk about how every window in Salt Lake City had a picture of my face in it. And every tree and every lamppost had a light blue ribbon or balloon tied around it, um, reminding people to look for me. And he used to laugh about it. And he'd say, you would not believe Salt Lake City. The whole town, the whole city is searching for you. The whole Salt Lake Valley is searching for you. But no one, no one will ever find you because I have you. And it actually seemed like that was true. I remember one time we were down in Salt Lake and I needed to go to the bathroom. And so he allowed um, Wando Barzi to escort me into the restroom. And it happened to be in the Hard Rock Cafe um, in downtown Salt Lake. And I didn't, I didn't have much on me, but I remember looking at the walls in the stall where I was going to the bathroom because I, I was allowed in the stall. She was standing right outside the stall door, but I was allowed in the stall by myself. And I remember seeing all of the scratchings on the door that other people had left. And I remember just thinking, maybe I can leave a message here. And so I remember getting one of the safety pins off that was on my... I'm not going to say outfit, because it wasn't an outfit, but clothing articles <laughs> that I was forced to wear. And I actually remember scraping, uh, scratching the word help into the side of the Hard Rock Cafe bathroom stall. And I remember thinking, surely someone's going to come in here right after me, and they'll see it, and then they'll rescue me. I mean, of course, of course you can't. At least, I don't think, I wouldn't know. I'm not smart enough to know what is a recent scratching and what's not. And what's sincere and what's just someone bored in the bathroom while they're sitting there. I don't know. Um, that, that, of course, didn't lead to anything. But I remember after I was rescued, wanting to go back to see if that scratching was still there. And I remember the Hard Rock Cafe saying, we are so sorry. We actually just had all those doors refinished. <laughs> Um, but I remember other times out in public where it seemed like we were so close. I was so close to being rescued. Uh, as winter started to come on, my captors started to talk of new places to go, and it needed to be somewhere warm because we just we wouldn't have survived the winter outside. Um, 
And so they started to speak of maybe Southern California or maybe Texas. And it was, it, it was eventually decided that we would go to Southern California for the winter. And my captors had taken me to the public library where they were pulling out maps to look at maps of Southern California. And while we were there, we were approached by a police officer. And initially, I, it, was a, it was a flood of mixed emotions because on one hand, it seemed like I could be rescued, I could be brought home, which is what I wanted more than anything in this, in this world. On the other hand, there was this person that was coming and I knew how capable and evil my captors were and what would they do to him, um, even if he was a police officer, what would they do to him? And if they got me away from the library, without anything happening to anyone at that point in time, what would happen to me next? Or if I was rescued and they weren't put in jail, they were let go, what would happen to my family? I mean, it's easy as an adult to look back and be like, well, of course, if you were rescued at that point in time, your captors would not be let go. It's easy to say that, but as an adult, looking back, but back then, I, I'd never had anything to do with the police before. Um, all I knew was, you know, innocent until proven guilty. I mean, did this prove that they were guilty? Or could they just turn and say, oh, yeah, we were looking for a map to help her take her back to her family. Oh, it's Southern California. I didn't even see the name on the map. I don't know. I mean, I was scared. And I'd been hurt for a very long time, so I didn't know what to do. So I just froze. And this man, he got closer to the table and he flashed his badge and he said, you know, I'm a homicide detective. I'm looking into the case of a disappearance of a young girl. You know, we've had reports that, um, you know, this young girl who's with you might possibly be her. Can you please allow me to see her face? Because I was, I was completely veiled. I was completely masked. And uh, my two captors, they looked at at this police officer and they said, sorry, we can't, it is against our religion and we, we cannot show you her face. You know, that would be violating her to, to show you her face and it would be very damaging to her, I mean spiritually and to her emotional well-being if she was to remove these veils for you to see her. You know, the only people that will ever see her will be her immediate family, which is us, and then her future husband one day. And I'm sorry, but you will never see her face. And they kept on talking back and forth, back and forth the whole time. I was sitting there frozen thinking, but wait, but it is me. But don't walk away. Like, don't give up. Just because they're saying it's against our religion, don't, don't turn around, don't walk away. But my captors, they weren't, they weren't stupid. They weren't, <laughs> they weren't crazy. They were very smart. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they knew exactly how to achieve whatever it is they wanted to achieve. And so eventually, after sitting there and talking with this homicide detective for, I don't know if it was 10 minutes or 20 minutes, he turned around and he walked out of the library being completely convinced that I was not Elizabeth Smart. As soon as he left, my two captors were like, that's it, we're going up into the mountains and you are not coming out of the mountains until we leave to go to Southern California. And that's exactly what happened. We made it to Southern California and the months rolled by. They actually made several attempts to kidnap other young girls, which thank goodness they were never successful because every time they'd go out, well, I was never left alone, first of all. Um, I was always left with Wanda Barzi as my guard. Um, every time he went out to try, I would always just panic and worry because what if he was successful? What would happen to me? What would I do if he brought back another young girl? Would I just step aside and let him hurt her the same way that he had hurt me? Did it make me a bad person because I was so lonely and so scared that there was a small piece of me that wanted someone to be a friend to me? Um, but was I really okay knowing that he was going to rape her? And every time this happened, I would just get sick to my stomach about it. And I'd always be relieved when he came back and he didn't have someone. And at the same time, um, I felt like my sense of loneliness would grow more and more every time. And eventually I remember 
my captors decided that they had tried enough in Southern California. They would go try a different state somewhere else. And I knew that was going to be my chance to escape. I knew that was going to be my chance to make it back home, maybe the only chance I might ever have. And so I thought of how they had twisted things and manipulated things and justified things to get what they wanted for the last nine months. And so I remember sitting there thinking, well, if it can work for them all this time, surely it can work for me at least once. So I turned around and I faced my captors and I said, oh, I know that God would never speak to me. I am, I am so sinful. But I know that he'll speak to you and I know that he will tell you if, if we're true. But I have this feeling that we're supposed to go back to Salt Lake. And I know that sounds crazy. I know that that is like the last place we should probably go to, but this feeling, it won't leave me alone. Do you think you could please ask God if we're supposed to go there? Now, do I really think that he believed in everything he said about God and God commanding him? No, I don't, not at all. But I think in his mind in that moment, he felt like, oh, this is great. I have made great progress because now she believes this whole, you know, I'm a prophet act that, you know, she was supposed to, she's just fulfilling her duty now that she's chosen of God. So now I can do whatever I want to her. Not that he didn't already, but that she'll be a willing participant in it now. This is great. So he turned around and he said, oh, I think you're right. We're supposed to go back to Salt Lake. And that's how it was decided we would return to Salt Lake. I ended up hitchhiking back, which is definitely not my preferred mode of transportation. However, it did the job, and we made it back to Salt Lake City. And I remember we were walking up State Street in Salt Lake, which is a pretty big street. And all of a sudden, a police car pulled up, and then another one, and another. And pretty soon, it felt like we were surrounded by police officers. And I was excited. I was scared. I was hopeful, I was terrified, <laughs> and I had captors on either side of me um, holding on to me, and it wasn't until one of the officers said, we need to question her by herself, you're going to need to let go of her, and they separated me away from my two captors, and he started to question me on my own, and he said, you know, there's this girl, and she has been missing now for a very long time and her family have never stopped searching for her they've never stopped loving her they want her to come home more than anything in this world aren't you ready to go home now and it was really only then in that moment that i was finally able to admit who i was and i remember i was handcuffed and put in the back of the police car which i thought oh shoot i said the wrong thing i shouldn't maybe i shouldn't have said it because they handcuffed me they must I must have done something wrong. Um, I was brought to the police station where I was eventually unhandcuffed, but I didn't really know what was going on and I didn't know what was happening with my captors. And I remember just sitting there and my mind was going a million different directions. And I remember thinking, okay, well, if they thought I was innocent, I'm sure they would have taken me home because, because my parents would want me to come home. So I must have done something wrong. So if I did something wrong, I guess I'm going to jail. Well, if I'm going to jail, I'm sure that they have beds there, and I'm sure that they have food there, and you know, maybe you don't get a shower every day, that sounds like a pretty big luxury, but I'm sure I'll get a shower like probably once a week. So I think jail sounds like a pretty big step up. I guess things really are only gonna get better from here. The only thing that could be worse was if I was released back to my captors. <laughs> and it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And right as I thought those thoughts, the door burst open and my dad came running into the room. And I remember he just picked me up into the biggest hug you can imagine. And I remember we were then transported up to the downtown police headquarters where I was reunited with my mom. And I remember looking at her and thinking that she looked like the most beautiful person I'd ever seen, thinking she looked just like an angel. 
And I remember seeing my brothers and my sister again. I remember going home that night and wow, I felt like a princess. I mean, there was carpet on the floor and there was running water and I had a whole closet full of clothes, albeit they did not fit, but they were mine nonetheless. I remember just feeling like everything that had been taken away from me had all of a sudden been given back. And I remember knowing that I never wanted to miss out on anything ever again. The next morning I was in speaking with my mom and she gave me this piece of advice and I feel like it served me well my entire life and I feel like it's probably pretty good advice for all of us because I'm pretty sure each one of us could stand up here and share our own stories because I've never met anyone with a perfect life. I've never met anyone who hasn't struggled at some point in their life. And the, the dang thing about it all is that just because you've been through one hard thing doesn't immunize you from other hard things, which is a bit of a bummer. If only they came out with a vaccine for that. <laughs> um, but I remember I was in talking with my mom and she said, Elizabeth, you know what these people have done to you is terrible. And there aren't words strong enough to describe how, how wicked and evil they are. They've stolen nine months of your life from you that you will never get back. But the best punishment you could ever give them is to be happy, is to live your life, is to do all the things that you wanna do because by feeling sorry for yourself, by holding on to the past, by reliving it over and over again, that's only allowing them to steal more of your life away from you, and they don't deserve that. I spend a lot of time thinking about that advice, and as I mentioned, I do believe it's good advice. That being said, I, I mean, I think it's the best advice I've probably ever received. That being said, I don't think that my mom meant that you go through something hard and you just make the decision to be happy and all the bad stuff disappears or melts away. I mean, if it was that easy, then none of us should have problems. Life should be perfect for all of us. I don't think it's that easy. I think deciding that happiness is important, deciding that you value it, that you value yourself, making that decision is the first step. That being said, I think that my mom fully expected me to go through the whole spectrum of emotion, dealing with frustration and anger and sadness and pain. And believe me, I did. I'm sure we all have felt all of those emotions at some point in our lives. Um, but I think what she wanted me to remember is that happiness is real and that it is there for all of us and sometimes Sometimes it doesn't just come to us, unfortunately. Sometimes we have to go out and we have to fight for it and we have to hold on to it and we have to believe in it and keep working towards it. Um, I, do, I just don't think there's such a thing as, as lazy happiness. I, if there is, like, you should definitely be up here speaking and sharing the secret because I don't know what it is. I feel like for me, it is always working towards happiness. It is, always, it is always a struggle because I am human and I do get upset and I do get frustrated and sometimes I do lose my patience or sometimes, you know, it's a really unfortunate day and I'm in a really cranky mood and when you lay things out, it's over small, silly things. But I do actually believe that happiness is there and it's something that each one of us deserves and actually, as I've gone out and as I've spoken, I think I probably am the beneficiary more than, than anyone else in the room because at events like today, I mean, I never imagined I'd be standing in a room full of people being held captive, listening to me for, oh, look at that, my time's about up, <laughs> almost, a significant amount of time. I mean, I never dreamt that would be my life ever. 
um, that they're here in support of each other, in support of a community. Um, I'm always blown away by the amount of people that I have been approached by, like I was saying at the beginning, of how many people cared about me and followed my story and searched for me and prayed for me and kept me in their thoughts over the years. I mean, that is proof to me, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully express it though, how much goodness there really is in this world. And the kind hearts and the wonderful people that really exist. I feel so lucky that I get to look into windows of communities like that all the time. I'm so blessed for that. And so with that being said, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here today. Whatever your story is, do not give up because life is beautiful and happiness does exist and you deserve it. And thank you, and God bless all of you. Thank you.